Right. Well, welcome everyone. So happy to have you all here. I'm Heidi Klumpkin, uh, LWV Minnesota Youth Engagement Coordinator. We're excited to be here with our second webinar in this series for youth who are interested in civic engagement and the adults that work with them. I have a few logistics and introductions and then we will get started. This is a Zoom meeting. So at the end of your present at the end of our presentations, we will be able to ask questions. You'll be able to unmute. Um, if you have any questions, raise your hand or put it in the chat and we can direct that to our speakers. Please stay muted until it is question time after both of our presentations have been shared. And some other reminders, you can turn on your own closed captions. Remember those are auto-generated, so they might not always be accurate. And then you can also pin the presenters so they stay large when presenting. Both presenters will take questions at the end. Again, please raise your hand or you can put them in the chat. And remember, we may not get to all the questions. The two presentations will be re recorded and um, posted later. Uh, please join us for the next webinar on December 5th to reflect on how the 2023 election season went, especially considering some of the new voting laws in place. We're very excited about those. Um, we will be, um, web I'm sorry, registration for that is open on our website, and I'll put that link in the chat in just a little bit. This webinar would not be possible without the work and feedback from our high school collaborative partners, Hennepin County Elections, Minneapolis Elections, YMCA, and feedback from the Minnesota Office of the Secretary of State. Thank you so much for your input. I'd also like to point out that today is the last day to register to vote, last day to vote, I'm sorry, it's the last day to register to vote in person before election day. Remember you can vote, register to vote on election day. Um, this doesn't mean that our work for voter education and registration is over. With 16 and 17 year old pre-registration and continued education about what is on our ballots, our work continues. In thinking about the speakers for our webinar today, I thought back to my first voting experience in Minnesota, my voting experience when I moved to Texas, and then my voting experience when I returned back to Minnesota. There can be a lot of moving parts and with national conversations about how hard it can be to vote in many places, I wanted to make sure we highlighted what to expect when voting in Minnesota. So the goal today is also to make sure that this information can be passed on and reused with our newest voters. With that, I'd like to introduce our speakers. We will start with Amy Perna. Amy is the Associate Director of the League of Women Voters Minnesota, having previously worked with various nonprofits and with the former Ramsey County Commissioner Janice Rettman. Amy now focuses on making vote411.org successful for Minnesota voters. Amy also has a passion for voter education, working with LWV MN members, local league leaders, and voter service. Our speaker about ranked choice voting is Aaron Grossman, an election administrator with the city of Minneapolis. Minneapolis became the first jurisdiction in the state of Minnesota to adopt ranked choice voting in 2006. Since 2017, Aaron has been involved in running ranked choice voting elections from voter outreach and ballot design to tabulation and results reporting. He has experience with RCV recounts, special elections, multi-seat races, processing write-ins, different tabulation methods, and results visualization. Holy cow, that is a lot of things. Additionally, Aaron has had the opportunity to advise several jurisdictions around the country who have implemented or are considering implementing ranked choice voting. Beyond that, Aaron can coordinates early in-person voting for Minneapolis. Welcome to you both. I'm so happy to have you here. You can see I didn't have your pictures, so I just uh, took some really great screen grabs from the things that you work with. <laughs> I love this Minneapolis elections uh, logo, your city, your vote. Um, so yeah, with that, I'm going to pass it on to Amy. Sure, thanks, Heidi. Um, hi, everybody. Nice to see you here today. I see a lot of pros in the audience and hopefully some students mixed in there too. But a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is just very um, sort of uh, basic information about how to register to vote, how to find information and stay in the loop on things. And then I'll talk a little bit about what it is like to um, actually go and vote on election day and the different ways that you can vote absentee. Um, and I, you know, there's so many ways to get at this information. Certainly our secretary of state has an amazing website that is just getting populated with more and more resources every day for voters and for people who are interested in doing, um, voter registration drives and for people who are just want to do a really deep dive into how elections work. You can find almost anything that you want there. 
So the first part of what I'm going to talk about is we'll be referring people to different parts of the Secretary of State's website. Um, and I wanted to point out one thing I'm going to drop in the chat really quick is just the um, link to the League of Women Voters website. Um, because we redesigned our homepage uh, with the start of early voting on September 22nd to really be a voter centric website. And we're really excited by that because from there you can just jump to, you know, checking your registration and that'll take you right to the Secretary of State's website. Or you can jump to, you know, uh, registering to vote online and it'll take you right where you need to go in the Secretary of State's website instead of having to hunt around. We tried to kind of funnel all that information um, in one place, some of the top things that we see um, people looking for. So I do encourage you. Um, to check it out. It's a great first stop um, as you're trying to uh, get information and, and learn about things. Um, Heidi, can you go to the next slide, please? So um, like Heidi mentioned, today is the last day to register um, in advance to vote um, in the 2023 election. And we are huge fans of registering in advance because it's going to save you a lot of time when you go to your polling place. Um, and this is just a screen grab from our, um, our homepage at lwvmn.org. Um, and as you can see, there's just, you can easily navigate um, to the Secretary of State's site in a couple different places. Um, and you can register online right from there if you'd like. Um, if you prefer to use paper, like I know sometimes when we're out in the field registering voters, um, it's just more practical to have that paper application. Um, so you can find that on the Secretary of State's website as well. And you can find that registration information in multiple languages and um, font sizes. And, you know, some of the things that you'll need to know or things that you'll want to gather before you yourself register to vote um, would be just like basic information, like your address, the county that you live in, your phone number, um, and also like your driver's license, your state ID number, social security number, those kinds of things. You want to kind of have that handy as you go into that process. Um, and in order to be eligible to vote in Minnesota, you know, you must be um, a U.S. citizen, at least 18 years old on election day. Um, a resident of Minnesota for 20 days and not currently incarcerated for a felony conviction. And we're all very excited and I'm sure you are too, but as you know now, um, 16 and 17 year olds can also pre-register. So that is one of the many exciting changes that happened during the 2023 um, legislative session. Um, next slide, please. Oh, sorry. So if you, um, if you are watching this and you missed the window to register early, don't worry. Um, in Minnesota, you can register on election day at your polling place. Um, so you would do this if you need to register, update your registration, or if, you have, if you've moved or you haven't voted in four or more years, you'll need to update that. Um, and to register at your polling place, you're, you're going to need to show your proof of residence before you vote. And there are, um, there's a number of ways to do this, but I'm going to kind of focus on the most common uh, ways to prove your residence so that you know what to bring with you. Um, the first and most common way, I think, is just with your photo ID with, or with an ID that has your name and your address on it. So something like a driver's license or tribal ID. Um, will will work perfectly for this. Um, you can also do like a combo of an ID and that's maybe expired and like some like something like a heating bill or a lease or something that has your name and your current address on it too, a tuition statement or something to that effect. Um, and another way to verify your residence is to have somebody vouch for you. And I'm not actually sure how common this is. Maybe Aaron know has like the stats on this, but um, but this basically means that on, on election day, you can bring somebody, a registered voter from your precinct to come with you and vouch for you and say, yep, I know Amy, she lives at 1422 Albany Avenue. Um, so that's another way to um, prove your residence. Um, if you're unsure uh, if your registration is active or not, you can also check your registration 
on the Secretary of State's website too, and you just plug in your address and um, it will let you know whether you need to update that or if you're good to go. Um, can we do the next slide? Thank you. So now assuming you're, you're registered or you've registered people, um, another great next step is to sign up for reminders. Um, so if you're interested in receiving text reminders about like key voting dates, deadlines, that kind of thing, um, you can text youth vote to 33222 and that will opt you into a system that the League of Women Voters Minnesota um, updates and manages called Textedly. And we'll text you all those deadlines and just remind you of um, what's what's upcoming. And of course, you can opt out at any time, but that's kind of a fun way to stay in the know if you're interested. Um, you can also, you know, if you need to look back at this information later, just hop on our website. It's all on that front page, on that landing page. Next slide. Thank you. So after after you register and you've signed up for all of your text reminders and all that kind of stuff, um, it's time to find out um, what and who is on your ballot. So I know many of you are probably sure and well aware of, of what you'll find there, but if you aren't sure, I think the best way that you can do this is by visiting, again, the Secretary of State's website. Um, and uh, clicking the link that says what's on my ballot. You just type in your address and it will find your precinct location and it will pull up um, everyone and everything that you'll see on your ballot. And it's such a neat function because you'll actually see exactly what your ballot's gonna look like. I have a little screen grab here of what the first page of my ballot will look like. Um, but you can, um, it's just, a, it's a really great resource and you can print this out and you can take it with you too when you go to your polling location. Um, there's lots of other helpful links too when you're checking out what's on your ballot. Um, you'll be able to, when you scroll down a little bit, you're able to find your polling location or Dropbox location if you have those for, for the particular election that you are uh, researching. And you can also search candidate filings too. So if you really want to get into the weeds on your candidates and look up their contact information, that kind of thing, you can do it uh, all right there on the Secretary of State's website. And uh, I'll talk about this a little more in a second too, but all of this information is also on vote411.org. So there's a couple different ways that we can um, get at this information. Um, next slide, please. So um, once you know who's going to be on your ballot, um, next it's time to learn about the candidates and the issues that you'll see. Um, and there's so many different ways to do that too, like everything. But um, you know, I'm going to go over some of the some of my favorite ways, which is vote for one one candidate websites and online searches, um, watching forums and debates and just using other trusted organizations. So uh, one of the, you know, one of the top reasons that people give for uh, why they don't vote is because they feel like they don't have all the information they need and they don't know the candidates. So um, this next section is really gonna get into that. Um, next slide, please. So this is, um, so my favorite way to research candidates is with vote411.org. The Secretary of State's website is great for all the logistics, looking at what your ballot looks like, finding your polling location, all of that. But what it's not gonna talk about or tell you is who are these people? What do they stand for? Why should I vote for them? That's up to the voters to, to um, look into. And Vote411 is a national resource that is built to be a one-stop shop for all things voting. Um, in a lot of cases, you know, we've got such a fabulous Secretary of State and it's the website is so helpful that in a lot of cases, it's more useful just to go right to the Secretary of State's website. But a lot of that information is also on vote411.org. Um, it is the state's only nonpartisan voter guide that covers every single race in Minnesota. So this means that at the state office, we ask every single candidate who's filed to run in the entire state to answer basic questions about who they are, what their issues are, 
uh, what they're going to focus on, just very kind of basic getting to know you kinds of questions. Um, there's a lot of other things that you can do on Vote 411 once you're there. Um, they have a, a first time voter checklist that gets accessed quite a bit. You can find your polling place, um, look at candidate forums in your area, learn about the different offices that you'll see on your ballot as well. And the whole site is fully translatable into Spanish. So it's a really great um, first stop on the journey to making your voting decisions. And let's see, I'm gonna check the time. I think I might wait to see if we have time in the end. I was gonna show you quickly how Vote for One One works, but I think I'll keep moving along in the interest of time. Um, and we'll go back to it. Uh, next slide. Great. Um, and I'm a huge fan of candidate forums too. Um, I started at the League of Women Voters in 2016 running their candidate forums in St. Paul. And I just found that you can learn so much about the candidates and the issues by taking the time to either attend a forum in person or watch the forums that are previously recorded. And, you know, in Minnesota, we've got 35 local leagues across the state, and they do a fabulous job with candidate forums. It really is a major part of our work is to host these nonpartisan um, candidate forums. This picture that's on the screen right now is a picture from a school board forum held last month in St. Paul. Um, and if you want to find a complete listing of league-sponsored candidate forums, you can do that again at our website, lwbmn.org, um, and click on the candidate forum link, or you can find that information directly in Vote 411. Once you plug in your address and you will get a list of candidates that are on your ballot, and you will be able to see right from there if there have been any forums that were uh, recorded that you can watch. Most of the time, they also get posted on YouTube, so you could search YouTube as well. Um, but other ways to learn about candidates, um, certainly visiting a candidate's website, if they have one, can be really helpful, or just doing an online search to try to find related news articles about the candidate or, you know, social media profiles or different things like that if you wanted to do a deeper dive. Um, and I'm sure like me, many of you are probably involved with other organizations doing work that you care about as well. And so you can also check with other trusted organizations to see if they have more information um, about candidates in your area or if they've made guides themselves. It's a really popular thing. A lot of nonprofits, um, uh, certainly in the metro area, are kind of making their own candidate guides too. So if you want to focus on more issue-specific guides, um, that could be a possibility as well. Um, all right. So now I'm going to move into um, actually voting. What's it like to go vote at your polling place? And what about absentee voting? Uh, how do we do that? So, um, so I'm going to start by talking about uh, voting at your polling place. So on election day, uh, you must vote in person at your assigned polling place. Um, when you arrive, you will need to sign in. And if you've already pre-registered, your name is already going to be on a list at your polling place. And all you'll need to do is just sign your name next to your name and address in a book that they have. And you will proceed to pick up a ballot. And there are election judges all over helping direct traffic and things like that. So it's not like you're going to have to go in there and figure out where to go next. There will absolutely be people directing you. Um, However, if you do need to register on election day, like we talked about earlier, you know, you'll need to show that proof of residence and that kind of thing. But if you're current and active, you don't need to bring anything with you. You can, you can just go ahead and, and vote. Um, you can bring notes with you or even a printed sample ballot if you'd like to help you remember who you wanted to vote for. Um, and if you have questions, there are election judges there to help you. Um, if you'd rather, you can also bring a friend or family member to help you mark your ballot, read your ballot, um, anything like that. So th you can bring almost anyone with you to do this, except somebody from your workplace, or if you're in a union, you can't bring an agent of your union. But other than that, um, anybody is welcome to come with and assist you. But again, there are lots of election judges on hand day of, and 
Um, they're absolutely there to help. So you should never feel like you can't ask them a question. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, so um, these are, this is the kind of setup I'm thinking of. Um, these little lighted tables, this is what Heidi and I carry around to our voting events, and we show people <laughs> what it's going to look like um, once you get to your polling location. Um, but you will be able to, once you're checked in and everything like that, you'll be able to vote in a private area. Your vote is secret, and you'll vote with a pen or pencil, and you're going to want to completely fill in that oval or square or whatever next to your, your choice. Um, if you uh, need assistance, or if you know of somebody who needs assistance, you can also use a ballot marking machine. You would just ask, um, you would just ask somebody there to help you with that. And a ballot marking machine has lots of options for marking your ballot. It'll have large print or audio instructions, keypad, touchscreen, that kind of thing. Um, and on your ballot, it will give you instructions um, and tell you how many candidates you can choose for each office. Usually it's gonna say one, but many cities have ranked choice voting, which Aaron's gonna talk about pretty soon. And then some local offices may have more than one seat to fill. Like Heidi and I live in St. Paul and we've got four school board candidates who or four seats we need to fill. So we've got like seven or eight candidates and we'll be able to choose four people um, for that race. And your ballot will count even if you don't vote on every race or ballot question. Um, and if you make a mistake, uh, you have the right also to ask for a new ballot. So don't be afraid to do that. Okay, next slide. Uh, so then after you have marked your ballot, you're going to take it over to um, the ballot counting machine. And there's usually somebody there kind of directing traffic also telling you how to put it in. You'll slide your ballot in and then you'll get your I voted sticker and and celebrate and put it on or whatever. Um, but uh, congratulations at that point, I guess your, your voting in person experience is done. Um, and then the next way that we have to vote is just by absentee ballot. So absentee voting is available in Minnesota and you don't need to have any excuse to use an absentee ballot. Um, with this method, you apply for a ballot um, this year, you have to apply on paper. You can't apply for an absentee ballot online, but you will be able to do that next year. Um, but after you apply, the ballot is mailed to you, and then you can return your ballot either through the mail or um, in person. And all ballots must be received by election day in order to be counted. So with the absentee ballot, you can vote early in person. Um, you know, times and hours kind of vary by location, but every voter will have at least one place where they can vote early. And in person, like right now, I'm in Ramsey County, I could go over to the Plato building and I could vote early there via absentee ballot. There will also be more locations opening up as we get closer to election day, and I don't have those off the top of my head, but you can always check with your county elections office to find the hours and, and addresses of those uh, locations. Um, so with this option though, voting early um, in person, with this option, you go to your county election office or other designated site, um, apply for your ballot, receive the ballot, fill it out and turn it all in right there. I only did this once. And so I'm not, I remember, I, re I remember a little bit about it, but um, it wasn't, it wasn't very difficult. Like I said, there's lots of people there to help you at every step of the way. Um, you can also vote early by mail. So 46 days before an election, um, you can turn in your absentee ballot via mail. And with this option, again, like we said earlier, you apply, the ballot is mailed to you. Um, you don't necessarily need to be registered to apply either. If you apply for an absentee ballot and they see that you're not registered, they will send um, a registration form with you in the mail. So that's kind of cool. Um, and again, this year you apply for your absentee ballot by printing out and turning in the application. You can't do it online. Um, and let's see, you can also request a ballot in alternative formats such as Braille. Um, and I will. As soon as I'm done chatting, I will put the number to call for that so that you have that. 
Um, and then one of the exciting changes from the legislative session this year is starting next year on June 1st, voters will be able to apply to be on the permanent absentee list. And so they'll have a ballot mailed to them automatically starting 46 days before an election and they won't have to keep applying year after year. So that's pretty exciting. Um, next slide. Uh, okay, so once you get your ballot in the mail, there's just a few more steps to consider. Um, first, you're going to need to have a witness who is a registered voter who will sign your envelope confirming that they witnessed you filling this out and verified your proof of residence. Your witness can be a friend, family member, or a public notary. Um, some banks and credit unions have free public notary services um, for clients who have accounts with them, so that's another place you can call your bank to see if they offer this service. Um, and again, if you want or need more help completing your ballot, anyone except an agent of your employer or your union is able to help you answer those questions. Um, there's just a little infographic on the slide here that kind of tells you which order to kind of fill things out. You want to make sure that you use all the envelopes and everything correctly. Um, I won't read through the steps here because you can see those on your screen, but then you'll either return your ballot by mail, and we recommend doing this early because as we know, postal, you know, sometimes things can get delayed. So you wanna make sure to turn that absentee ballot in early. Um, or, and you can return it by mail or you can bring it in to your county election office. If you do that, you do need to bring it in by 8 p.m. on election day. Um, if you're unable to make it and return your ballot, somebody else called an agent can return your ballot for you. They will need to show an ID though and sign in um, at the county election office when they return your ballot. And that I believe needs to be done by three o'clock on election day. Um, and then once your ballot is mailed and delivered, you can follow it along the process on the Secretary of State's website. You can check the status of your absentee ballot and check to see that it was received and counted and all of that. It's kind of fun to follow along. Um, okay, next slide. And if you want a refresher for, you know, for any of these things, just again, go to our, our website, lwbmn.org, um, scroll down a little bit and there you'll have two options, how to vote in person and voting at home. So you'll be able to review these steps, look at that infographic and uh, hopefully get all the information that you need to cast your ballot this year. Um, and last slide. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, everybody. I just threw my contact information up there and some of the website, some of the resources that I talked about are uh, right up there as well, too. Uh, if you have any questions, you can always email or call me or Heidi. <laughs> I'm happy to answer any questions and help get you the information that you need. And next, I will turn it over to Aaron to talk about ranked choice voting. Thank you right. just so much. Yeah, Aaron, go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Amy. Um, and Two, two notes, I think you listed the same day registration methods in the exact order of how prevalent we see them. So people who use a, a current ID with their name and address, and then people who do that combination that you discussed, and then people who are using a voucher um, as well. And one note I just put in the chat too is another 2023 law change is that uh, you can actually drop off your ballot all the way until 8 p.m on election day now. So it was, it was 3 p.m., but now um, we'll be here even later, <laughs> ready to receive any ballot on election day. Uh, well, thanks again, Heidi, for having me. Um, I'm Aaron Grossman. I'm an election administrator with the city of Minneapolis. My main program area is overseeing our, our early voting, um, our in-person absentee voting, to be precise. Um, so we're right in the middle of that now, ahead of our 2023 election. But I also work on our ranked choice voting program um, and have been involved in elections using ranked choice voting uh, since 2017. I have a few slides to share. I'm going to see if I can successfully do that now. And uh, let's see. One thumbs up tells me I'm all right. Thumbs up. Okay. So let's talk about ranked choice voting in Minneapolis. And of course, um, I'll touch on a little bit about uh, the other jurisdictions in the state of which there are now uh, five total who are using ranked choice voting. But here in Minneapolis, um, we have about a quarter million registered voters and 137 voting precincts. And um, one 
something that we try to do with all of our election materials or key election materials is translate them into our primary languages, which here are Somali, Spanish, Hmong, and Oromo. Um, this is an additional, or can be an additional challenge uh, with, uh, with ranked choice voting, just because there's many terms that may not have a direct one-to-one -one translation um, with, with different languages. So we, we work hard to make sure that people have the information that they need. In Minneapolis, all municipal offices are elected with ranked choice voting. Um, and, are tip, and are conducted in odd years. So on our ballot, um, in a typical ranked choice voting year, we have a number of different races because of all the different municipal offices here in the city. So we have um, mayor, um, city council, which is for 13 different um, wards. Minneapolis has park board districts. So the city is broken up into six um, uh, park board districts. And then there's also races uh, like we were talking about where multiple candidates are elected. In Minneapolis, that's the Board of Estimate and Taxation who has a role in setting the property tax levy um, where two citizen members are elected. And then also for the park board, there's three at-large members in addition, addition to those districts. Uh, finally, we can also end up with ballot questions on our uh, municipal years, which we often have. Um, we'll talk about how ranked choice voting works, but once in a while we'll get the question of, from voters if they have to rank, you know, yes is my first choice, no is my second choice, or something like that. Of, of course, those ones, uh, ballot questions are not, do not use ranked choice voting. So the image here is our 2021 ballot. Um, as you can see, there are many, many candidates, and I'll dive into exactly what the ballot looks like uh, shortly. Um, and then one note just for in, here in Minneapolis in 2023, it's, it's a city council only election um, due to redistricting and needing to conform to the updated ward boundaries. Um, but typically there will be all of these races on the ballot um, and there will be again in, in 2025. So I, I expect that this group is um, at least familiar with ranked choice voting in concept or instant runoff voting as it, as it um, is also called. And basically, it works where voters, uh, rather than selecting just one candidate, they are able to select candidates in order of their preference um, up to a certain number of rankings here in Minneapolis. That's three rankings for the, for the voters for second and third choice. Um, you can use this voting method you know, as part of a primary process and then to winnow down the field for a general election or like the cases in, in um, both Minneapolis and the other cities in Minnesota who use ranked choice voting, uh, the process actually eliminates the need for a primary election in municipal years. So it's one, one area that I know is um, attractive to some of the jurisdictions who have adopted ranked choice voting is that rather than having a, what is typically a relatively low turnout um, August primary in an odd year, uh, that can all be consolidated into just the, the November election. Um, with the use of ranked choice voting. So the basic process um, is that uh, voters vote. The first choice votes are tallied. If a candidate has enough votes to win, which is more than half of the votes in a single seat race, they win and we're done. And it's quite similar to um, how people are maybe used to voting in a plurality contest. Um, but if no candidate has reached that, that threshold, has enough votes, um, the candidate with the fewest votes is eliminated. We look to the second choices on those ballots of any eliminated candidate. And then uh, if they have a, if the voters have a second choice, we reallocate those to continuing candidates and simply continue that process until somebody does have enough votes to win. So with that, the voters, uh, you know, your vote is only counting towards one candidate at any given time, but it allows uh, voters to express more preferences and have their vote continue, even if their top choice might be eliminated. I do wanna share um, a video here, it's just about a minute long um, from NPR a number of years ago, illustrating this process with post-it notes. I'd encourage you if you, um, you know, live in a, a ranked choice voting jurisdiction or nearby or just interested in learning more, most of the cities now, Minneapolis included, have you know, a kind of branded video um, about pizza toppings or favorite trees or modes of transportation. Uh, but I, I have also found that this uh, simple post-it note explainer does the job 
pretty well. So I'm going to try to play and just give me a shot if you don't hear anything right away. Pick your favorite color. The ranked choice voting way. Instead of voting for just one color, you get to rank your top three. Well, purple is the best, but if I can't have purple, I want blue. And if neither of those wins, I guess I can live with orange. Now, let's count up everybody's votes. Under ranked choice voting rules, it's not enough just to get the most votes. You need a majority. More than 50% of the votes. Purple's ahead, but it has only seven votes. It needs at least 11 to win. So we eliminate the color in last place. Sorry, Orange fans, we're going to your second choice. Two more for green. One for purple. But no color has 11 votes yet. Still no majority. Bye bye, blue. One more for purple. Four for green. And we have a winner. The Ranked Choice Voting Way. All right, quite the nail biter. Um, congrats there. So in uh, Minneapolis and, and also the um, other jurisdictions who have ranked choice voting, voter education becomes a, a more important than ever because uh, you know every four years or every two years we're we're introducing something that's maybe less familiar to a number of voters. So here's an example of a flyer that we send out. Um, to all of our polling places, and we also include in all of our uh, absentee voting materials, um, helping just illustrate the process to voters. And I, I think the other cities have um, similar types of materials. So just instructing about choosing your top candidate and your second choice, and then also pointing out on the right-hand side some of the more common errors that we might see when voters um, may uh, rank the same candidate multiple times, thinking that it might help a preferred candidate when that's not the case, or um, choosing multiple candidates in one um, as one choice, as you see on the bottom right there, which causes an overvote, and then uh, neither of those those votes um, would count to either of those two candidates because you can only rank one candidate per preference, and so this this helps illustrate things and it does maybe a little bit better than just words. Um, we do see a, a bit of an increase in voters who need to um, get a new ballot. So like Amy mentioned, you have the opportunity if you make a mistake or um, mismark your ballot when you're at the polling place, you can always return it and get a fresh one from the election judges. And so we, we do see a little bit of an uptick as people get used to this, but by and large, um, the kind of simplicity of rank your favorite things, one, two, three, um, works pretty well in our experience. So I've alluded to this before, but the five cities that are using rank choice voting currently are us in Minneapolis, um, St. Paul, St. Louis Park, Bloomington, and Minnetonka. And um, other cities and, and school districts have shown some interest um, uh, over the years, uh, some cities uh, like Duluth have even voted on it and, and opted not to adopt ranked choice voting. So it's still kind of an active conversation. And despite being um, discussed and, and introduced as a potential um, statewide option in the 2023 uh, legislative session and before, um, ranked choice voting remains truly a, a local uh, decision and only available to uh, cities who operate with a city charter. So it's, it's relatively limited um, at, this, at this point and really requires cities to take a large role in adopting the rules um, by which ranked choice voting uh, contests are conducted as there's not like a state level blueprint like there is for uh, state and federal elections here. And then just a bit more broadly, um, ranked choice voting has, has you know, steadily gained um, uh, momentum across the United States. So there it is now used in more than 60 jurisdictions nationwide, including Maine and Alaska, and then some large cities, uh, New York City recently, San Francisco for many years and, and more. Um, seems to be taking hold in, in Western states like Utah, Colorado, California, Washington to some degree, um, not exclusively, but 
That's where I think some of the recent expansion has been. And like I just mentioned, there's no one way of running ranked choice voting. There's some different options you can do. Um, the kind of basics mirror one another, but each jurisdiction may have slightly different rules. Um, just a bit more about Minneapolis. I, I won't linger on this too long, um, but uh, ranked choice voting was approved in 2006. So it was a ballot question at that point and then implemented in 2009. We've used it in five elections. And that initial implementation was a large challenge as Minneapolis was the first city um, in the state to use ranked choice voting. So both determining how to do tabulation with limited um, capacity of voting machines, and then also just how to educate voters was a huge question um, in, those, in that run up to uh, 2009. So what the city did is, is um, and has continued to do is uh, have a household voter guide. So uh, mailing uh, uh, information to every household in the city um, ahead of 20, the 2013 election, there was a big mock election effort to both introduce, reintroduce ranked choice voting and um, show off the new voting equipment that was available then. I mentioned that we produced many educational materials and instructions that are translated. And then it was a, a big part was just getting out to community events, making people know that this was happening and, and uh, informing people across all types of, of media. Um, and we know that each each ranked choice voting election, there's you know, hundreds, if not thousands of people who have now moved into the city and need to be reintroduced to this. Um, although it seems like the landscape is different as it, than it was in 2009. And a lot more people are familiar with, with this voting method from as it's expanded or as it has become more um, covered. And then um, the city takes a much larger role in the tabulation of ranked choice voting races um, because there is no single approved system statewide. So there's some more there, rather than having a results available on election night, as people may be used to when all the results are transmitted, races that, are, that um, need to go to that tabulation process where candidates are eliminated and votes are reallocated, uh, that doesn't happen until the day after election day. And so we work as hard as we can to get those results out as soon as possible. And we've been successful in recent years to get everything completed um, the day after election day. So this year we expect to have all of our results out um, by Wednesday, November 8th. But it is something that, that comes with this type of system that there isn't a uh, automatic uh, snap your fingers way of of producing the results in the same way that um, just a plurality contest might be. Let's just jump ahead here um, to look at a few different ballots. So here's the 2021 Minneapolis ballot that I mentioned. Our 2023 ballot is much less involved with just one race on it, um, city council. I also wanted to highlight how these ballots might look a little bit different. So in Minneapolis, Sorry, I'm zooming around. We have, um, you see the candidates listed in, in three columns for the first choice, second choice, and third choice. And the candidates are listed three times and voters can select their preference there. On a St. Paul ballot from this year, you'll notice that St. Paul offers, um, up, I think it's up, up to six choices if necessary. And again, has the candidates listed in each section. So first choice, second choice, third choice across the top, and then fourth and fifth choice um, on the bottom there. Also allowing a write-in option at every step. A few other cities here. Here's Bloomington's ballot this year. I'd say most similar to the Minneapolis ballot with first, second, third choice across in various columns with different races um, demarcated with a large black banner. And St. Louis Park looks very similar as well. You'll notice that on some of these um, cities, you know, races like for mayor and city council will, will use ranked choice voting, but on the backside, a school district race, because a school district is a separate jurisdiction, um, is using a vote up to four uh, voting method, as it's not subject to ranked choice voting like the city elections are. And here's Minnetonka, which looks similar as well. 
I did want to uh, just take a moment to talk about our post-election ranked choice voting survey. Uh, Minneapolis has conducted an uh, academic uh, survey after each of our ranked choice voting elections, and it's really helped us collect some data about how voters are interacting with this type of voting method and guide some of our you know, additional voter outreach and training that we provide. So looking here, um, voters were asked, uh, did you find it simple or difficult to use ranked choice voting? And we've seen pretty consistently um, 90%, so nine out of 10 uh, voters are saying that they found it simple to use the method. So simple to rank their choices, one, two, three. I think this is a pretty common number that I've seen across you know, different cities or from different organizations. Um, and I think demonstrates that, that uh, it is relatively simple once people might get over the fact that it's new or looks a little bit different. Similarly, um, in Minneapolis, this we've seen that people's support for using ranked choice voting in future local elections has, has kind of hovered around the 60% um, mark. And that's pretty similar to the amount, the support that ranked choice voting had when it originally passed in 2006. Um, so we see that uh, kind of support holding here. And then we also do include non-voters um, in the survey, um, who people who did not vote in the municipal election and one question that they are asked is, um, why didn't you vote in the election? Uh, so these results from 20, 2021 survey um, indicate that, you know, the vast majority of people have an answer that's something like, I didn't have the time or I don't care about municipal elections or I forgot about the election. 12% um, say that they didn't vote because they don't care for ranked choice voting. Um, uh, and, you know, it's important for us to know that it's not, the overwhelming reason for people at least. Um, and then it allows us to maybe drill down a little bit there as well. And then one, one thing that was an interesting question um, is looking at the confidence of voters and the accuracy of the ranked choice voting count um, amongst voters and non-voters. So the blue line here is amongst voters right around three quarters or so um, said that they were confident or very confident in the accuracy of the ranked choice voting vote count. And you can see that non-voters are much less confident in, in the accuracy of the count. This is interesting to us and, and you know, we were very curious to ask this as um, elections and voting counts have, have had more and more scrutiny in recent years. It really probably shows more about a divide between people who are involved in voting in municipal elections and those who are maybe less inclined to be involved. All right. In the interest of, of holding on for some questions, I would invite um, everybody to visit our website where we have a lot more information about um, our ranked choice voting history, some of these notes about things that have changed. So the system that we put into place in 2009 has changed many times in response to, um, to make the process more efficient and to make sure that we can get results out as soon as possible. We've also expanded our offerings and like the data visualizations that we've um, included on our website, which I would encourage people to check out as well. Um, a lot of times, you know, like that video that we watched from NPR or maybe an explanation from me, although that's less likely, um, but often other data visualizations, people just need to find something that kind of clicks with them. And then they, they become, um, you know, much more confident in, in this type of voting system. Let's, let's just look at a few of those data visualizations. So on our website, we include a, um, a table, which just shows how many first choice votes did a candidate have? How many votes did they have in the final round? We also have a bar chart, um, which is a pretty common um, ranked choice voting expression. So you can see we're looking at round one right now. So after counting the first choice votes, then after candidates are eliminated, we go to round two. And you can see that the continuing candidates at the top um, increase their, their votes based on votes being reallocated to them from eliminated candidates. And then one more round and you can see that a candidate then um, was elected. And then the final super colorful um, data visualization that we like to provide is it's called a Sankey diagram. You might've seen something similar in um, different types of data presentations. 
And this really shows the vote flow, um, how votes flowed from, um, from one candidate to the next. So these uh, kind of swooping colorful ribbons are, are kind of showing the, the flow of votes as candidates are eliminated. And that's a, a really nice visual way. Um, although some of the ribbons can get pretty small, especially when we have lots of candidates. So again, um, I'll drop a couple of links into uh, the chat here, um, both our ranked choice voting page and then a sample election that we can use. Um, but otherwise, thanks for um, hearing about this. You know, there's, uh, it must be near, you know, relatively near a million people in Minnesota who are living in a ranked choice voting jurisdiction. If I'm doing that, that math estimate, right, of the populations of Minneapolis, St. Paul, Bloomington, Minnetonka, and St. Louis Park. And so it really it does affect um, a number of people. And we just want to do what we can to make sure that voters are confident and prepared when they get to um, marking their ballot and that we are able to answer any questions that, that they might have um, to make sure that they are, are um, filling out the ballot as, as they would like. So thanks again for having me. And I, see, I hope that some of the notes in the chat are some questions. I um, would love to answer any now. Let me well, unshare here. Yeah, thank you both so much. Let's get to the questions. I'm gonna stop recording.